I would say that of all the cases I had, probably my highlight as a public defender uh, was Henry Hui Hui IV, who was charged with robbery. Um, the jury went home late at night. The next day, he, he saw me on the doorsteps. He said, you know, Marie, when the trial started, I thought I was guilty, but after your closing argument, I had reasonable doubt. And that, that was, you know, if, if you've tried a case, that's got to be classic. And I said to myself, <laughs> I think he just admitted to me he might have done it, you know. Retired Judge Marie Milks had a passion for criminal law. After serving as a public defender for seven years, she was appointed by Chief Justice William Richardson to a judgeship on the State District Court. Four years later, Governor George Ariyoshi appointed her to the Circuit Court, where she spent much of the next 20 years judging criminal cases. Marie Milks, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Retired Judge Marie Nakanishi Milks was not only the first woman to be appointed to the State District Court in Honolulu, she was also the first Asian. She went on to become the first woman appointed after statehood to the Circuit Court, where she was a judge until she retired in 2004. Marie Milks grew up in Honolulu in the late 1940s and 50s in a family that didn't have a lot of money. Despite that, her parents made sure she got a good education, both inside as well as outside the classroom. I had a, a very different kind of upbringing, uh, partly because my father was really old when I was born, first of five children, 45 years old. And so um, he was very proud, you know, that he had a child. And um, he was my, I call him my first male friend. Um, my father worked at night as a waiter. He was at the Waikiki Tavern and the, then the Oahu Country Club. So he would take me to the beach. I spent time with Jay Akuhed Pupule's children. Uh, he took me to Chinatown where he played chess with his buddies. And then on almost a daily basis, we would go to the Art Academy, then the Honolulu Art Academy, um, and then to the zoo, mostly to get me away from home where my mother was taking care of the other children. They came two years at a time, you know. So you had a private audience with your dad. All I those, did, yeah. All those months or years? Yeah. Years. Yeah. And it was, it was a, I guess, a, an introduction that men were okay. You know, older men were okay. Um, and I think it helped me in later life to accept a lot of the mentoring that I got from some of the male judges. And you have to understand, when I started at the public defender's office, some of my fellow public defenders would grouse about judge this and judge that. And I saw them in a different light. Uh, a lot of them were like my uncles, my dad. And when they criticized me, I just took it as um, they were correcting my behavior. Your mom didn't speak in English, and she, she wasn't schooling you in things. One of my earliest memories of the, the of growing up with my mother was going to my friend's house one day, Judith Angel, in the third grade, and I just thought she was a cat's meow. She had blonde hair. I wanted to be a Howley. I wanted blonde hair. And uh, we were in the living room, and I heard her radio, and I heard English voices. I said, wow, your radio has English. My radio only has Japanese. She turned the dial. I went. So your your dial never left the Japanese no. channels. No, oh. I thought that was volume control. So I <laughs> <laughs> third grade now. I mean, slow in the head. I was ten years old almost before I realized that radios actually had channels on them. You know. What about your dad? Because you had a lot of time with him. And my father was very very strict about English. He was working as a waiter. He was with members at the country club, and we could not speak pidgin in the home. I mean, really. What happened if you did? Oh, he would get call us pakatare and tell us that low class um, and, and made us speak English. Even with your buddies? Yes. 
I was the person that, I mean, I was teased in elementary school, oh, Howley lover, that kind of thing, because I wouldn't speak pigeon. I couldn't. I mean, that was a no-no in the, in the family. So one day we had neighbors come to the house. They went up the steps, jumped, and broke the pune. And Rodney says, I never do them. I never do them. I said, it's not I never do them. It's I didn't do them. You know? <laughs> So I, had to, I was the, the one correcting <laughs> and, people. And Kaahumanu School, that was, that was a lot of town kids, lots of pidgin. A lot of them didn't do standard English as well as pidgin. It was pidgin only. Yeah, but we had teachers. You know, I had wonderful, wonderful teachers in elementary school. And I had one teacher in particular who was into poetry in the third grade, Mrs. Macario. We had to recite poetry. But um, my recollection of Kaahumanu was very competitive for grades and test scores, you know, we had to do well. And um, we were required, I mean, not only by the teachers, but by my parents. I had, I had to produce, I had, if I had a report card with all pluses and one check, I had to explain the check. What's, what's well, this? What was your explanation? Um, I didn't blame it on the teacher. I said, I guess I have to study harder. Mm -hmm. You know, that was and that always, was the acceptable answer. That probably was. the only acceptable mm -hmm. answer. So your father is this Renaissance man who loves mm -hmm. art, music, chess, polo. Um, he played polo. He surfed. We have pictures of him with a surfboard. You know, with his polo, with his horse. Um, so I was exposed at a young age to a, a whole different kind of world then even though I wasn't financially or in a class that was, you know, high middle and felt very poor, um, I used to have to walk to the natatorium from New Uanu, from Country Club Road, because we couldn't afford the bus fare. I had to sew my own clothes and, um, you know, I, I think, though, looking back, that probably is the best thing that happened to me because it, it really allows you to have gratitude, you know, for everything you have. I had one good friend who's now deceased who believed in me. And, you know, when we were seniors in high school, uh, going on to be senior, um, she asked me, why aren't you in the Honor Society? Mm -hmm. I said, I, nobody told me. And she went to the registrar and, and found the information on my GPA, my card, back in the days they had index cards, was paper clipped behind somebody else's information. Oh. So you all, so you'd been making good grades, but you weren't recognized as no, someone I who made good grades. Yeah, I had about a 3.9, whatever it was, which is pretty good. So I got into the Honor Society, and my friend Mamo, who got me into the National Honor Society, was going off to college. And she said, why, why aren't you going to college? And at that time, you know, the tuition at the University of Hawaii was $100 a semester. And my parents were not going to pay. They couldn't afford it. Um, and the only way I could have gone to college would have been a scholarship. She filled out an application for me and got me uh, a State of Hawaii scholarship for four years through then council member Frank Liu. Amazing, um, and, and we should, you should, what's Mamo's last name? I know she says she passed away. Yeah, Mamo Kuanoi Powers, oh. and her, her daughter, you know, recently got married and has a son, so I'm kind of like a grandmother. Oh, um, that's a life-changing friend. It, it is, I mean, I didn't even apply to college. You know, so this is somebody to whom I owe not only her, but her, her daughter and grandson, you know, gratitude. Retired state judge Marie Milks finished college in three and a half years, graduating Phi Beta Kappa. She was considering options for what to do next when, once again, a helpful classmate made a suggestion, which led Milks to law school. There was a big scandal in Hawaii with Hiram Fong. There was a nepotism issue uh, that he was hiring relatives. So Patsy Mink decided she would hire somebody through the Department of Labor. There was a posting for a job with her. And a classmate of mine said, hey, you should go to Washington. Uh, so I applied, 
went through an interview. I was a great typist. I could type 120 words a minute, really fast. Um, but the day she was going to call me, I had changed my mind. I had decided I didn't want to go to Washington. So I practiced. Mrs. Mink, I'm sorry, but I've decided not. I'm sorry, but um, I, I decided to take another semester of school. I practice and practice. Phone rang. Marie, Patsy Mink's on the phone, and I say hello, and she says, can you start on January 19? And I said, okay. <laughs> that was it. What did I just do? This is the end of my life as I know it. Um, but you know, an, another opportunity. And working for her, I think the, the biggest revelation to me was how you could be a woman and be a, a professional, you know? And she was remarkable. I, I wished more people knew her the way I got to see her. I know she was considered an absolute workhorse. Oh. And she expected so much from her staff. Oh. We had to work Monday through Friday and four hours on Saturday mornings which is what was almost a non-starter for me to go to law school because I had Saturday classes as a night student and I had to talk to the dean and he said, I think it's gonna to be too hard for you to do this. And I said, I wouldn't have a You went to Georgetown, Georgetown with working four five and a half hours, uh, five, five and a half days a week? Yeah, yeah. And that was a tough school to get into. Yeah, it, it, yeah. But you know Weren't what? Were you a first there too? Were you a first? I think that's what helped a lot. Um, if I were to apply to Georgetown Law today, I tell you my chance of getting in would be zero next to zero. Well, why was it? Why was it good then? Because I was first Asian woman to ever apply. Ever to apply? Yes, oh. first. And um, there were so few women. This is during the Vietnam era. The, the number of male students had been reduced somewhat, so they took on a few more women. And uh, I just happened to be lucky, you know, that, that. that and you met all of their criteria, which, which, which were helped high. them. Yeah, well, I, you know, I had good grades in college, and I, I had the Phi Beta Kappa admission, so that helped me. But um, I just, it was happenstance. And that was when I first wrote to uh, Sam King. He corresponded with me and advised me about law school. And I thought, hey, I think I want to be a family court judge. I applied to law school, by the way, to be a judge. That was going to be my career move. But it was family court that I was aspiring to at that time. In law school, one of Marie Milk's professors was Sam Dash, who was also her boss at the Criminal Law Institute, where she worked on a criminal offender program. Dash became one of the Watergate scandal prosecutors, and John Sirica, who presided over the Watergate trial, was one of her trial practice instructors. Milk's exposure to criminal law shifted her interest away from family court. After I started law school, criminal law became the thing for me. I just wanted to be a criminal judge. Attorney. At that time, I had kind of just wanted to start as a, as a criminal attorney. Prosecutor, defense attorney, didn't matter. It didn't bother you which, which way you'd be arguing? My own personal family background and being, feeling like an underdog in many ways. I thought I was a pretty good champion for uh, the, quote, the oppressed. And I related, I could relate to a lot of the, um, you know, clients who came from, you know, family with very little. Although I have to tell you, I used to get into fights with my clients who were very anti-Japanese. Back in the 70s, they felt that the Japanese people had things easy, you know, DOE, oh, look at all the DOE people, and da da you, you Japanese. You know, I used to get that from some of my YNI clients. And then the, the Kawananakoa Public School came out of me. I said, hey, that's what my, hey. You know what, if you want to you wanna see who had a tougher life, I'm gonna win, so back off, you know? And not that I had a tougher life, but 
I didn't go to Punahou, I didn't go to Pryor, you know, and that was the expectation of many of the clients, that I had the silver spoon, that I must have come from a rich family. How did you develop trust, their trust? Um, I, I worked hard. See, that's the other thing. I, I don't think that any one of them could ever feel that I sloughed off on, on things. Although, you know, I didn't have the world's best clients. I had some who were just horrible. I had three of my aunties go to court to watch me do a trial. It happened to be a sex assault case. And after the first day, they didn't want to go back. They oh, it's terrible the kinds of people you represent. So they didn't come back to watch me anymore. <laughs> How did you put it together in your mind? Um, you know, in some cases, it sure looks like your client's guilty. Um, and, it wasn't and you're that. associated <laughs> with that person. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and it wasn't that they looked guilty. A lot of them were really, really guilty. Um, but there's a little bit in some of us when you have a challenge or something difficult, it, 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 makes, it makes it almost easier because I always felt that even if my client was in fact convicted, it wouldn't be that they were innocent and were convicted, that they likely you know, the case was proved. The harder question for me as a public defender was a question people asked all the time. How can you do it when you know they're guilty? How can you represent them, you know, when you know they did it? And my answer was, well, the prosecutor went to law school. It's their job to convict. It wasn't my job to get them off. But it was a rational, you know, it's something that you have to kind of understand yourself what your role is your role is to defend it wasn't to prove innocence and it wasn't to prove that my client didn't do it so it was i think an easier approach so your job was to provide a spirited and, and aggressive yeah, defense yeah, yeah you understand your job and that's when you can have pride in what you're doing after serving as a public defender for seven years, Marie Milks was appointed to a Hawaii State District Court judgeship in 1980. You know, I remember when you went from the public defender's office mm -hmm. to circuit court judge hearing criminal cases. Mm -hmm. I was a journalist at the time. Uh, there was a lot of concern that you would be a softy, you know, mm. oh, poor defendant. Oh, you, yeah. you, would, you would go on that side, mm -hmm. but actually that didn't happen. That was rarely the criticism leveled against you mm -hmm. if, if there was mm -hmm. criticism. Mm -hmm. But see, I had career criminal defendants, so a lot of the sentences were mandatory. Mm -hmm. So I, I, even if I wanted to be a softy, I couldn't. But you know, in, in all honesty about my own self-assessment, I thought I was pretty fair about what the appropriate sentence was. And from the general public standpoint, you don't get to read everything, you know, yes. the pre-sentence report. And as a judge, you can't repeat a lot of what you see. But if people saw the full extent of the reports we have, I think more people would be appreciative of what judges evaluate. The other thing is, and I, and I actually was called on a, a jury uh -huh. at one point, I realized, and I saw it for myself, that the very people who say, throw the book at them, send them away, we didn't want to convict. Exactly. I mean, because it, it was now, hard to decide that somebody yeah. might have to go to jail. Yeah. That plus, you know, proof beyond a reasonable doubt is not, you, it's not what you feel. Because there were a lot of cases where there was that sense, but the evidence wasn't sufficient. And you have to learn to, you know, distinguish levels of decision making. Um, but I, I really honestly believe that 99% of people, if they were given the same kind of information that any particular judge had, would likely agree with most of what judges do. You know, I had one client, for an example, who was, uh, who, uh, was a serial rapist. He, he raped a lot of women. And back in those days when I was a public defender, they called it rape. They didn't call it sex assault. He was the nicest client you would ever meet, admitted his wrongdoing every time, but he still sexually assaulted people, but only people who were handicapped or in wheelchairs. I mean, right? I mean, the, the reaction is, well, what kind of horrible person would do this? Well, then I, I as his attorney, got the pre-sentence report. 
horrors of horrors, when he was three years old, his mother put firecrackers in his ear and lit them, you know? So a lot of the defendants themselves have been very badly treated. Not an excuse, mind you. I'm not saying they gave him a, an excuse, but it can explain, you know, how people can go bad. Yeah, I, I've heard the expression, victims often victimize others. Exactly. You know, one of the bigger points for me in my entire legal and judicial career was handling the Xerox, the Uesugi case. And the Byron Uesugi seven murder case mm -hmm. uh, was mm -hmm. probably the biggest, one of, well, one of the biggest mm -hmm. um, legal cases in mm -hmm. Hawaii over the mm -hmm. decades. And I remember that morning when the, um, I was listening on the police radio oh, as a too, reporder and, uh, you know, shots were ringing out yeah. at the Xerox building and there's mm -hmm. seven mm -hmm. deaths mm -hmm. and you were the judge presiding over the trial yeah. of the Xerox employee accused. Right. right. Very interestingly, during the trial, um, he, he kept staring at me, you know, from, and, uh, but he never scared me. I just felt, I felt sorry for him. I, I do, did, and a lot of my associates think there's something wrong with me when I f said I felt sorry for the defendants, but I did. I felt sorry for the father. You he, know, he lived with his father, as yeah, I recall. Yeah, and the father had, you know, went out and apologized for yeah. him. And we see that so many times in crimes that happen, parents apologizing for their children. And, you know, I feel for them because it's, it's tough. It's, it, to to be aligned with somebody who does something, you know, ha heinous. I feel sorry, actually, for a lot of the defendants and the families, what they go through. But I'm, I'm saying that this feeling sorry is more about the, the humaneness of what I've done, but it's their, it, the punishment was well-deserved. But that's not to say I didn't feel sorry for the victims either. You know, it's just that it's sad when people do things like that, you know. You sent him away mm -hmm. for a life term without parole. Consecutive. Consecutive. Right. There's several gratifying things about that case, one of which is, and I always subscribe to this as a judge on the bench, and that was to have regard for the victims. You know, you don't take their side, but you always have to appreciate what victims go through. They don't, people don't ask to be robbed People don't ask for their homes to be burglarized. But a couple of years ago, one of the um, widows wrote to me and asked me for a job recommendation. You know, and I, I've had a good relationship with victims in other cases as well. Um, but with respect to that case, one of the most gratifying things for me is very few people know who the presiding judge was on that case. And to me, that's the ultimate uh, compliment to a judge who presides in a case, and that is they don't identify you with the case. It was about the facts, it was about the defendant, it was about the victims, and very little about the judge. While Marie Milks was spending long hours as a public defender and then as a judge, she and her husband, Bill Milks, now a retired attorney, were also busy raising a family. My daughter, um, her friends would say, oh, you're so lucky, you know, your mom's a judge, you're gonna da, 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 and not so true. Our son, on the other hand, was, really liked the idea that I was a judge because the male-female thing, right? Having a mom as a judge mm -hmm. from a male perspective was easier for him to handle than our daughter. I regret that I didn't spend more time with them. But if I didn't have decent kids who I didn't have to go to parent-teacher meetings all the time, where would my career have gone? So they, they really, it was a family, uh, you know, adventure, so to speak. Did it work the other way with your husband? Bill has never uh, been intimidated by me at all. And his, one of his lines to me is, Marie, you know, you're not, don't, you can't be a judge 24 hours a day. But he's been really, really supportive. Everything I've, I've striven for. 
State Circuit Court Judge Marie Milks retired from the bench in 2004. Since then, she's been serving as a part-time mediator, helping people resolve cases through compromise rather than through the courts. At the time of our conversation in summer of 2015, she and her husband were traveling the world, a passion that, as you will see, Marie Milks has pursued since she was a little girl. Mahalo to retired judge Marie Milks for sharing your story with us. And thank you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha hui ho. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. When I was three, I said to my mother, basically, I was going to go to school. So my mom says, okay, fix, fix me a little brown bag with some books and some lifesavers, and bye. Right. Off I go, and I cross the street to take the bus. And I got on the bus. The bus driver didn't say anything to this three-year-old girl? He, had, he saw me get on the bus with somebody else. I knew where to get off, and this was at Kiamoku and King Street, the old Sears building, which then became HPD. And my cousin and auntie and everybody else lived on Young Street. So I go, I pull the uh, signal, and I went to my auntie's house. Now here's my auntie thinking that my parents just dumped me off at their house without telling her. So I'm playing with my cousins. Meantime, she goes to the corner of Young Street and Kiamoku, and they have this uh, wagon. They had the Sakanaya-san and the Yasai-san, where they pull their sides up and sell fish or sell vegetables. So my aunt is there when somebody comes up and says, did you hear on the radio your niece was kidnapped and the police are looking for her? And she says, she's in my house. So <laughs> it got to be the family story. Marie is going to travel the world when she grows up.